Hi, I'm Becky. Um, so the inspiration for tonight's topic came a few months ago um, as my husband Matt and I were discussing the odyssey he and his brother have been on for the past several years um, to find the most suitable living situation for their mother. Um, so their father passed away almost 20 years ago now and their mother, who has a chronic degenerative disease, was suddenly living alone hundreds of miles from either of her children. Uh, my, mo my mother-in-law's independent, stubborn spirit has served her well in fighting her disease, but sometimes these qualities had a paralyzing effect for her sons um, as they tried to ensure that she was safe and secure. They hired overnight caregivers and later a full-time daytime caregiver. Um, she eventually moved states to be closer to her sister and uh, my brother-in-law, and um, at this point she had a living caregiver. Last year, she finally made the move to a nursing home. The prospect of a nursing home had loomed large for us as a kind of boogeyman. Um, and yet, after just a couple of weeks, my mother-in-law was thriving. Um, she had increased social interactions uh, and activities. She eats better than she did before. She uh, has friends and family that visit. This was really an unexpected um, for us, to say the least. Um, so that day as Matt and I were talking, um, he said, I feel like everyone is looking for this perfect solution that doesn't exist when really you just have to find the best solution for your situation. Um, so tonight I'm hoping to learn more about available options for elder care, their pros and cons, um, and tips for having challenging conversations with medical professionals as well as loved ones. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Benjamin Rosenstein. Um, and Dr. Rosenstein completed his family medicine training at the University of Minnesota St. John's Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program. Uh, following residency, he pursued his interest in the care for older adults and completed a geriatrics medicine fellowship at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He has a deep interest in primary and specialty care of older adults in multiple settings as well as health and aging policy initiatives. So. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, so a review of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so types of different places. Uh, how to decide when, if it's time to make a change of place. Um, how to decide what's the best type of place to go to. How to go about making this decision. And the steps that are, it's not just about like, okay, we decided to do this, but what else do you need to do? Oh, there we go. All right. Good. Good. All right, next slide. Okay. So kind of an overview of the types of places to talk about. So there's home. Um, independent living, what's often called a senior apartment. In various types of assisted living. Memory care, which falls into assisted living. Nursing home, both uh, subacute rehab or most often around here, what's called TCU. And also long-term care, which is when we say nursing home, but you really are probably thinking of. I put them up here for the sake of it. PACE is a specific program, program for all-inclusive uh, all care of the elderly. It's um, actually a Medicare Part C program. The idea is kind of nursing home cares, but essentially an adult day program. We don't have any of those in the state. Um, the VA is, I put it up here just like if your parents or yourselves are in the VA systems, these things still exist. They often go by different names and there's kind of different formats of going about getting um, care. And then hospice, I throw in here mostly because it's another form of care, another benefit uh, through insurance and can be done in any of these. Next slide. So if you're kind of making this decision plan, where, where do you go next? If you're someone or your parents or your loved ones are mostly independent, you, know, um, you may be thinking about home with home care. So that is somebody coming into your home providing assistance, usually what we call um, non-skilled, then that's an insurance term, care. Um, so things like helping with dressing, hygiene, bathing, things like that. Um, very limited insurance coverage of that. Um, if you're what we'd call dual eligible, so Medicare and Medicaid, sometimes you can get some coverage through that. Otherwise, most of it's private pay. You're hiring somebody, this is a Oftentimes people look into websites to find somebody to come into their house. Um, and oftentimes family involvement is often still there and still relatively high. Um, 
So if you have somebody coming to the home, it's often, say, f eight hours three times a week, four hours every day of the week, so a lot of care is still expected from others. Kind of within still the realm of mostly independent, I would call the uh, independent living facility, um, which often goes by the term senior living. Um, and essentially these are an apartment where there are access to other things. Um, so it's still pri private pay, essentially you're paying rent. Um, you can hire in help, so it's a little bit like home with help, with help, uh, home with home care. There are options to sort of go a la carte a little bit. So you maybe, if you need some assistance with meals to add that in or some assistance with transportation that can get set up. Um, and we'll sh I'll show sometimes an independent living is attached to a much larger complex and then you may have access to other cares in various fashions. So beyond like mostly independent to maybe needing some increased care, let's talk about assisted living facility. This is the Wild West. Um, so there's various, very many different types of this. Um, a CBRF is a community, community uh, continuity-based retirement facility, so lots of different parts. Um, and RCAC is a um, smaller version, it's retirement care access uh, community. Um, the, there's a lot of variation in here in terms of what is provided, what the costs are. Um, there's a lot of a la carte, so when you're looking at some of these places, there may be like a base care rate and then those show you kind of what else you can purchase. Um, and again, not covered by insurance. Uh, but this is where we're starting to step into there is some level of 24 seven support. Um, and usually these places have a nursing staff, um, some amount of medical staff. Um, I have I see people in assisted living, but there are many people I don't see because they still go out to see their own physician. Uh, memory care is technically a subset of assisted living and is the wilder west because there is even less regulation of this. Uh, Minnesota, we're lucky in that there is a bit more than most places. Um, but it is anywhere from this is a unit with a, a floor, a hall, a unit within an assisted living that is locked to um, in Minnesota, the regulations now require extra training and care of those with dementia. Um, extra, extra um, understanding of how to manage things, um, just a little bit more in depth. Um, it is not a nursing home that gets confused a lot, and I'll talk about why this gets really confusing. Uh, behaviors, so behaviors that are associated with dementia uh, can be an issue even after somebody is admitted to one of these. Um, if the, even though it's say a memory care where you think this is sort of meant to be dealt with, they may come, they are not under any legal requirement to keep somebody, unlike a nursing home. Um, so they can say, this is too much for us to handle, I have to go somewhere else. Those are the types of things like, again, this is really wilder west. You want details if you're looking into this. Next, um, yep, next slide. Okay, so within, so nursing home, it's kind of in that realm. So we've come from assisted living where somebody needs some level of assistance, memory care, somebody needs some level of assistance. Kind of what separates the assisted living from nursing home is medical complexity. Uh, so, and nursing home has two parts. So subacute rehab that is, um, as I said, around here typically called transitional care unit. Uh, this is generally post-hospital care area, so you decide you've been in the hospital and you've been evaluated and it's thought you're not quite ready to go home, need a little bit more rehab, get your strength back, things like that. So you go to subacute rehab and one of the reasons I say this is, in a, this is a nursing home is because people, again, this is one of those, I never want to go to a nursing home, it's like this isn't a nursing home because that's worse stuff. <laughs> uh, that's where a lot of general rehab is done. Um, a physician or and or uh, advanced practice uh, person, generally a nurse practitioner, um, 
We are required to see you once every 30 days. We generally see you much more than that. Generally at least once a week, if not more. Um, and this is about the first time we're gonna talk about insurance. Medicare covers your first 20 days um, and then 80% coverage up to 100 days from there. Um, and in terms of like transitional care unit, this is meant to be a transition from that level of care to somewhere else, whether that be home, maybe talking about other places to move to. And then long-term care, and this is what, when somebody says nursing home, this is what they mean. Uh, this is kind of the colloquial nursing home. Um, so this is high level of care, um, assisting with often people in a nursing home are requiring a fair amount of physical assistance and there's also a fair amount of medical complexity. Um, these places are highly regulated. Um, for example, uh, assisted living regulations in Minnesota, there's about 20 regulations that apply to them. Nursing homes, there's about 150. Um, so again, this is 24 seven care, generally all cares, um, physical and medical. Um, we can sort of escalate care. So if somebody's in a long-term care facility and we think they need a bit more complex medical care and we don't feel like they need to go to a hospital, we can kind of escalate within there to a degree. Um, again, private pay until someone is eligible for Medicaid. Uh, so this is where the terrible term spend down comes from. And again, we are, there's usually uh, there is a physician and advanced practice provider. We're required to see you generally about every 60 to 90 days. We often see you much more than that. Um, but that's, also, that's a, actually a Medicare requirement, but generally we see people for more frequently as things come up. So, um, as I said, sometimes these places, and more of these are coming around, there, there's these larger complexes, things like, um, most of the, if you're looking into places, places like, and I work on the east side a lot, so the serenity type places, Presbyterian, um, those are a lot of, they have a lot of these types of places. So this is, take all those levels I was talking about and mash them into one big complex. Um, and usually, and the advantages of this, as I said, say you move into independent living, you're in your own apartment, you're on your own, you can technically call for assistance from one of these other spots, but technically you still have to, like if you need to go to the hospital, call 911 or something. Um, but the other part where this can be an advantage is you essentially not only are uh, going into independent living, you've kind of bought your way into the other parts if you need them. Um, so you get, you get some preference. Um, and the other thing is say you're living in an independent living part of one of these complexes, you go to the hospital, you need some subacute rehab, you have preference to go to that rehab unit and then back to your place. Uh, these can be pretty expensive up front because you're sort of buying that seat for the long term. Um, but again, it can work into your, to your advantage in that way uh, and being able to access any of these spots. So what are considerations when you're considering where to go, where you need to help a family member figure out where to go? It's cost, unfortunately, is a big factor. Uh, and with that insurance coverage, what the care needs are, companionship, how much of it is, how much that's a part of the decision, compatibility with the person really, um, and continuity. So are we just, if you're looking for one specific type of place or do you want access to all levels? When, that becomes a big question. We can keep going. Um, so, it's kind of the, when we talk about when, it's, it's home is never no longer home. It's what we talk about is when is home no longer best? Um, is because I'm not one that goes up to somebody and says, you can't go home. But we do sometimes need to talk about is home the best place to go? Yeah. And Keep going. Yeah. yeah. So one way to approach this is when can your kind of reframing your home into a house, and when can that no longer be your home? 
so one way we approach many things in geriatrics is with this model that came out now many years ago, actually. Um, and it's from the Institute for Health and Care Improvement um, and developed by uh, other geriatricians in the field. And essentially, we try to take down any issue uh, with older adults and break it down into these four M's with the fifth. Um, so things that affect mind, mobility, medications, what matters, and all this is all tied together and makes it really complex. So if I'm thinking about where does somebody, when is it time to move somewhere, and where sh do we need to talk about going, if we think about mobility, what are the barriers to mobility? If it's, you know, the person, if you're somebody that's just having trouble driving and that's it, you might need some, you know, we can get med uh, medical rides, get other ways to get mobility. Um, is it something where you need or your family needs help getting to the bathroom? Then we may be talking about higher level of care. What type of modifications are needed? Are you just installing railings into your bathroom? Do you have bars on the bed? Um, do you have a, the handles that go around the commode handles that go around the toilet? Um, are you needing a lift chair? Do you need a stair lift? Do you need other people to move you? Um, if you're talking about things like other people, that generally means needing assistance, assisted living situation of some type. Um, and then how often are we getting around? So is it just the transport as I was talking about, or are we somebody needing to help get out of bed and doing, getting out of the chair 24 seven? In terms of medications, kind of how I think about this is one, how many? Um, I deal with people that have a generally a decent number. Um, how complex is it? And for most people, more than two meds actually equals pretty complex. Uh, again, I have to take care of people that take a lot more than that. Um, what types of meds are we dealing with? Are we dealing with oral medications only? Are there injections involved? Are there infusions involved? Um, are there issues with dexterity? Uh, medication bottles that are made child proof or also tend to be very arthritis proof. Yeah. Um, <laughs> vision also, we have the bottles with the type this big. Um, are there issues with swallowing? Are there memory issues? You know, so oftentimes one of the current concerns will come up is, you know, the pill, bo the pill bottles are still full or the pill box hasn't been touched for a week. Um, so does somebody need to be there to help with the medication regimen? Are there side effects that need to be watched? Um, low blood sugar, if somebody's on insulin, for example. Uh, low blood pressure, medicines that can cause themselves increased confusion, drowsiness, falls, bleeding. Um, and then what type of oversight, if we're looking more assistance is needed? Is it just a family checking in every day, seeing you know, medications are taken appropriately? Does somebody need to be there to give them the medicines regularly? And I just put this up. This is one of my favorite papers um, from Dr. Boyd and all. She's a geriatrician over at Hopkins. Um, so this is just breaking down how this gets. This can be complex very quick. Um, so this was a stand. Just any general person that maybe you're seeing that I'm seeing in primary care that has, I think it's like hypertension, needs some medicines for their cholesterol inhalers, hypothyroid issues, such. Um, and so with that being a very, you know, not something unusual, person's on 12 medications taking 19 doses at five different times a day. We don't do that as much anymore at least. Um, there's also all the other non-medication, -medic non-pharmacologic things we recommend, and there's all the drug-drug interactions we worry about. So. That's where the how many medicines are there, or how much oversight is needed, it can become complex quickly. Um, when we think about the mind, the brain, often part of this conversation is there's a concern for cognitive impairment. Um, if it's mild, mild cognitive impairment, meaning the person has cognitive impairment, we can diagnose it, it's there. Um, often is a kind of first part of uh, dementia presentation but they are still managing on their own, still able to do their daily tasks. Or have we crossed into dementia where now more difficulty with daily tasks? Are there other mental health issues that could play into this? We sometimes talk about 
Um, does the person have too much cognitive load? And that's where, say, somebody can move into a place and thrive because we remove some of that cognitive load. And how much does that impact on other tests? So a person may have difficulty with, oh, say they have, they have difficulty with cooking. Um, and that may have an impact on their other functions such as, I mean, they're going, they may not get, they may start feeling weak if they're not eating as much and have issues with falling, um, things like that. So behaviors, worrying about if, are there issues with the kitchen uh, where there are many dangerous objects? Is hygiene a concern? The person, sometimes people forget to take a bath, for example, um, or cleaning the house, or is there a hoarding concern? Is driving becoming a problem? Wandering can sometimes be an issue. Issues with sleep or potentially the lack of it. Are there risks to a partner, which are not necessarily like concerns of physical violence, but um, are there things that are putting the other person at risk? Falls are a big issue, especially the bathroom that has lots of hard objects with sharp corners. Um, and then if there are those concerns, what interventions are needed is that does somebody need somebody in there daily? Is there an in-home caregiver? Is family starting to stay overnight? And are they able to keep doing that? Are you locking the doors? Are you worried about those medications like we were talking about? And as you can figure out, these, these do start to run into each other and this gets really complex. Um, so you have multiple meds and you may have multiple appointments and there's multiple therapy appointments and how does somebody get their food into the grocery store and there's the risks at home associated with all those things um, and cognitive impairment and maybe behaviors are playing into all of that as well. How are you met? Is somebody able to be home? How are you met? How is that even going? And there's also sometimes there's this like who's taking care of whom dilemma of, you know, this more often I see with when I'm talking to children of families, um, but like mom and dad together make a more or less functional unit, but if one of them goes down, the entire house goes down. Um, and so that can be a, a, an impetus, for especially typically children of families to say, we really need to talk about if we need to change where we are. And then also I, did, I put it at the end, but what matters to somebody is a, is probably the ultimate question of this conversation. Um, so I've heard various versions of these, but you know, somebody says they'd rather die than live in, in a nursing home. Um, I was born here, I was raised as a family here, I will die here. Um, I've had a, some people have had some recent versions of that, like I've lived in the same house for 48 years, I'm not moving anywhere. Um, home is where my family is, so it's maybe a little more openness to move. Uh, I don't want to be alone anymore, I've heard as well. So then there's somebody is actually looking potentially to find a different living situation. Um, and within what matters is kind of how these all play in together. What level of independence? What's the person's function? And also, what does home really mean? And like this, this really is a goals of care conversation. Um, it's not a Again, this is not the you have to move, you can't stay at home, it's what's important to you and how do we meet your goals. We're trying to ba balance risk and safety. Um, we can't always be concerned about safety in medicine, otherwise nobody would go anywhere and everybody would be in bubble wrap. Uh, so we are balancing risk and safety with level of independence that is the person desires and also is reasonable. And then kind of how to talk about it, as it says, this is really a goals of care conversation. So it's how do we have a goals of care talk? Um, go ahead. So a couple ways I'd frame it. Um, there's the W's. So I wish, I worry, I wonder. So um, you can go ahead. Oh, I got weird. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, well, <laughs> so in terms of the three W's, ways you could use this are, um, you know, I wish you could continue living in your house, but I worry about how much more help you're needing, and I wonder if we should talk about a different type of place. 
um, or if somebody's already, maybe they are living in assisted living and maybe we're talking about moving to a nursing home. It, oh. um, I, you could say, I wish you could learn to return to your assisted living, um, but I worry I or they will not be able to provide as much care as you need and I wonder if it's time to make a change of place. Um, and so look, kind of a way to approach it again is like, there's obviously a concern there, but you're not like demanding something of the person um, and you're kind of inviting their opinion. Next slide. Other ways to uh, have this talk, this is a little bit more complicated, but the remap. So you reframe the issue, you expect some emotions because usually we're talking about a highly charged thing. Kind of map out what the future of this may look like. Try to align all your values together um, and then plan steps that match those values. Uh, this is very much like geared towards how we sometimes have goals of care conversations um, with patients. So that's why it sounds a little bit, maybe a little medical. Um, there you go. So that's just, just some examples of how this can work. So you reframe the situation as like, it's kind of, and sometimes again, this is more of how I will often approach this coming from the perspective of uh, being a physician is like, I don't think going home is an option anymore, so I get to be the bad guy. <laughs> but we should talk about other possibilities. Um, I'm going to expect that that probably will bring some emotion. Somebody's like, no, I want to go home. Um, and then, you know, we'll kind of, you kind of talk through that, talk about what the emotions are, why they're there, what we're seeing, you know, maybe I'm talking about the medical diagnoses, what we're seeing in terms of, uh, function, maybe I get some history from family, it's like, mm, there's some concerns here. Um, so given all that, what we have talked about was most important to you and how do we meet those values? Um, and oftentimes, you know, the values, the values discussion can be very, a place to really open things to someone and be like, you know, I really want to support what's important to you. Um, and this is what you're telling me. This is how I think we get there. Um, so in terms of like an independent living place or a senior apartment, um, this is like other apartments, you're basically paying rent. There are generally some requirements around this. Usually there's an age cutoff of some sort, um, where it'd be like a 50 plus, com 50 plus complex or maybe a 70, uh, 70 plus complex. They generally will want to know that you have limited, if any, care needs. Um, generally this is mainly a move into downsizing. Um, so somebody says they have, there's too much house, don't need that anymore, still able to live on my own, still want to live on my own, but need to downsize. Assisted living, usually a few more steps in this. Um, often there's forms related to the facility to complete. They will maybe do a financial review to show that, again, generally out of pocket, so showing that you're able to pay. Um, often require a medical exam within a month. Um, some may have you change PCP or primary care provider. As I said, oftentimes people in assisted living are relatively independent, still go out to see their own primary care provider. Um, so that's not often a necessary requirement that, they, that places have, uh, but they will need that review because they will also need orders for your medication and other care plan orders. And then off some type of infectious disease clearance usually around TB is part of it. Getting into a nursing home is a little bit more tricky. Um, actually, I'm gonna talk about this side first. This is the usual way it goes, is that somebody is admitted to a hospital. Um, we say they need a bit more care. They go, before they go to the next place, they go to a subacute rehab. Um, and from there, they go to long-term care nursing home. This is so that in the hospital, they get all the therapy evaluations, all the medical evaluation, all the other clearances, and basically are able to move on. We can directly admit somebody into a nursing home from the community. It's a little bit, uh, little bit longer typically of a process. Um, so usually that's like me referring somebody to um, our area agency on aging, which I'll talk about, um, like senior linkage line. It kind of determines eligibility. So is, do you need a nursing home generally? Um, there's a pre-admission screening, which is a little bit of this part. Um, a social worker often gets involved to help manage the transfer um, 
again, there's usually a review of financial and insurance coverage, infectious disease clearance. Um, and some of that therapy and medical evaluation is still done, just done in the outpatient settings. So that's why it takes a little bit more time to do this. But it can be done. I've done it a few times. Um, so, and this is kind of regardless of where you are um, or if you're going to move, but other important things to do would be to complete a health uh, healthcare, healthcare directive with identifying your healthcare advocate, having a discussion around that, often completing a post as well or a provider order for life sustaining treatment. Um, and that, another one that often is kind of overlooked is a power of attorney for finances. That's when people say power of attorney, that's what they're talking about. Um, and that is separate from, in Minnesota we say healthcare advocate, um, but some places use the term power of attorney for healthcare. Um, so they, they, can, they, can, they can be the same person, a power of attorney for healthcare and power of attorney for uh, finances, um, but not always, and some people want them to be separate. So, and some resources for you. So the ARP is a good resource for kind of general things. Um, senior linkage line, that's, um, so every county in Minnesota has an area agency on aging in the metro area. Ours is called Trellis. It actually uh, manages both Ramsey and Hennepin. Senior linkage line is sort of like an area agency on aging for the state. Um, and it provides uh, resources for like um, changing place communities needs, um, kind of managing through Medicare if you're making that switch. Um, Somebody like me can go through it, and as I said, can refer through it to, as far as determining uh, nursing home eligibility. Use the nursing home compare website to compare different nursing homes. You can do read between the lines a little bit of that. Um, some places get dinged really hard for things that have, um, that have occurred in the past and um, needs to be updated. Um, but it's based, it's kind of it's a five star system, and generally places with more stars are a little bit nicer, a little bit of a probably a better place to go. Um, our, we at the university have a geriatrics workforce enhancement program grant, and we have this website that has all kinds of resources on it. It is a little tailored to health professionals, but there are resources there for families as well. And then another good resource, but there's few and far of us uh, are is your geriatrician. There's very few other medical professionals that are in these places and understand how they work. Um, so if you can find a geriatrician, they can be pretty useful. Questions? So I just have a tiny, tiny backstory. I am the one of two kids. Mm -hmm. Do they know anyone that's moved? No, they're uh, able for now. Yeah. Um, everybody in our circle and family has been like this, and then suddenly they're not. So. Right. I can't. I haven't been able to impress upon them the urgency. Yeah. And so no one that they know has moved to a home, but they've had friends who have died. Right. And sometimes it's like, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, so, the, and to summarize, question was kind of around how to assist your parents or family that is sort of ignoring it. <laughs> Unwilling. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, it, sometimes going to be, do they know anyone else? Um, have they? Sometimes they have friends there in a the place, but in your case, it sounds like not. Um, 
and actually maybe sometimes it can be helpful to push that this does sometimes happen fairly abruptly you know somebody's functional at home they're making they're making it along and something hits them and they don't return to their prior level of function and they haven't made plans and it's kind of pressed and feels pressed upon them um, and so trying to frame it as this I am concerned about this and this is what happens in the years to, in the years to come you know you're not talking about necessarily right now but in the years to come what are your plans how sh how would you how would you like me to approach this um, The next, I mean, and probably. Can, I'm sorry. Can you just? Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, you could look at the elder justice dip, um, service. You know, sometimes elder attorneys can help people through these decisions because there's a lot of finances going to it. Um, uh, otherwise, the other person I'd maybe talk to is if you have access to like a geriatric social worker. Another person that's hard to find. Who pays for them? Um, that would be somebody you hope they can find in the clinic they go to. Okay. <laughs> or just, if they, and the primary clinic they go to is a social worker. If, if they're not a geriatric social worker, should also be able to help kind of go through what that process can be and maybe try to help introduce it to them. I, I just would add, I was in your exact same situation trying to get my parents to have a talk. And what pushed, what, <laughs> what actually got them to the table was their primary care doctor told them that they needed to have this conversation. It wasn't enough that I told them, but as soon as their primary care doc told them, you must have this conversation, they were willing to come to the table. So if you have access to your parents' primary care physician, you might want to talk to them. Yeah, that's another way it often comes around, honestly. The, it's, it's, it's sometimes the, the you know, I have an appointment with a patient and their daughter comes along and says, can we have this discussion? That's how sometimes it goes. Yeah, um, following up on both of those, I think it matters that it's coming from somebody in authority. Um, you know, we're going through this with his dad now, and it wasn't the primary care doc, it was the emergency room doc with the fifth trip in one month. Do from it. falls when finally, well, one was uh, on one of the penultimate trips. Um, they got a social worker mm -hmm. in who got him at least thinking about it and calling a place for mom and the VA. Mm -hmm. But then we were back two days later, a week later, whichever one it was. Um, and that doctor's like, I don't think it's safe for you to go home. Mm -hmm. Like, but I think it takes that authority. And a number of years ago, it went the same with. Um, his wife had Alzheimer's. And when we were trying to get care inside the home, he kept thinking he was doing okay. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter that we would try and do it, but then it was when his primary care after issues and stuff about um, maybe it's time for hospice, and that brought in all kinds of care. And he was like, this is great. But it, it seems to need um, an authority besides us to step in and accept it mm. often. It, it can help to come from a third party, essentially. And <laughs> a respected third party who they acknowledge knows something. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak a little bit more about the balance between risk and safety versus mm -hmm. independence? because um, in some cases the desire for independence is very linked to quality of life or perceived quality of mm -hmm. life. And we can all be concerned about safety, but if it diminishes the independence too much, mm -hmm. that can be a negative effect too. Yeah. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so trying to, a little bit more about the balance between independence and the safety and risk part. 
So, for example, your father, was it or his? His father. His father. Who's falling, had five falls that brought him to the hospital in a month. The, there we'd be talking about, you know, how is this impacting your independence? One of these falls is going to potentially, the common example being you break your hip, um, and you're not going to be very independent that way. Um, so sometimes, it's kind of how do the how do the risks or safety profile affect that independence? Um, other ones. I think about would be um, especially when we're concerned about somebody that has cognitive impairment and that cognitive impairment is getting is progressing getting worse um, and we sometimes will recouch the discussion a little bit as we want to support your independence um, but to do that I think what's best to, we're going to need to offload some of these things um, Otherwise, you, again, then you can talk about otherwise there's these concerns about how and how those may affect your independence. But sometimes putting in the language of how do we support your independence in a different place. Well, I have a quick example, too, for my mother-in-law. Can you again. talk to the mic? Sure. Um, sorry. So back to my mother-in-law. Um, she was really, really, really reluctant to use a wheelchair. She has MS. Mm -hmm. and you know, for her walking, even if it was really, really slow with a walker, was, you know, meant a lot to her. Um, she finally went ahead and got the mobilized, the, or the mobilized wheelchair, and it was amazing. She was able to do tons of stuff suddenly. She could, because a lot of times she would just sit in place, you mm -hmm. know, and, and kind of wait until somebody was around and could help her get something, and then suddenly she was doing everything. Um, way more independently. So yeah, I think that reframing or again, them just finally seeing what it can do for their life and their quality of life, um, that that actually gave her more independence. Talk about walkers. Can you explain more the concept of cognitive load? Yeah. Um, uh, so asking about what we're talking about, what a little bit more about what I mean by cognitive load. So. Um, you got, I'm going to have you all do something. So take a minute, think of a simple task, something you do every day. And just in your brain, list off every step of that task. There you got All right. So. Um, example I'll use is, say, brushing your teeth. Anybody else do brushing their teeth? All right. Yeah. Something you do every day. Super simple, right? All you have to do is go down and brush your teeth. I have to decide it's time to brush my teeth. I am going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to get the toothbrush out. I'm going to get the toothpaste. I'm going to put the toothpaste on the brush. So on, so on, so on. So all of those steps, you do it in a split second. You don't even think about it. It doesn't require much of your, it does not require much cognitive load for you to do that. Somebody that has cognitive impairment, uh, especially as it's getting more progressed, they are trying to go through those steps a bit more intentionally because it's harder to think of it and it takes more of their cognitive load, which means other things to think about are harder. So they can't, you know, it's how they can't, they can only think about so much at a time. So if we take some of those tasks off their plate, they may be able to interact more effectively, they may have be able to do more activities they like to do because they're just not as tired, essentially, because they haven't been thinking about all these other things as much. Um, this is a two-part question. Mm -hmm. Could you at least stand up so here I'll project? So maybe thank you. Or grab the mic. If a family member is willing to become a paid in caregiver mm -hmm. in the period it. before nursing home services mm -hmm. are needed, how do they go about that, i.e. making sure it's reported to the IRS, taxes are paid? The second question is, if the family member is already a designated power of attorney, are mm -hmm. they still legally able to be a paid caregiver because that yeah. feels murky? Oh, yeah. Um, so talking about like PCA, essentially. Yes. Yes. Um, so most of that is essentially uh, sometimes the person you're caring for needs to be evaluated by some physician and say yes they need some level of care um, not always and then generally it's applying through the state um, and often that's where I ask one of my social workers to help out too uh, 
as, especially as far as like filing taxes and such. I have no idea. <laughs> that happens. That happens eventually. Um, you could still be the the power of attorney um, because you're you. It, you're, as long as you're, you're, you can still be the power attorney for finances. Um, I can see where you're talking about it could get murky, um, but if there certainly, if there are concerns with how the finances are, be, are what's going on with the finances, we often look for it. Um, but also within being a power of attorney, there are certain protections put in place as a financial power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, I get this one. <laughs> Oops. I have a feeling many of you have faced this um, when a relative shouldn't be driving anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my case, I'm going to speak about my father. I went on the Minnesota Department of Natural, Res uh, not natural Resources, uh, Driver and Vehicle Services. Mm -hmm. And they have a list of what makes an impaired driver. My father met every criteria. <laughs> he checked yeah. every box. And so they helped by, um, they could say, yes, we can request that your family member have to come in and take a test. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that was so helpful because, of course, dad didn't pass the test, and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. And he accepted that, and again, on the same thing, someone in authority. And I know that, I believe I'm right, mm -hmm. that a doctor can say, we recommend that you be done driving. Am I right about that? Yeah, we can recommend it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll let you uh, <laughs> yeah. speak to so, that. So this, and this, this is one of the most common areas, and it kind of brings these discussions to the, to the fore, um, is the person, you know, we're worried about somebody's driving. Um, so as a physician, I am not allowed to say, like, take a person's license, uh, but I can say you shouldn't drive. Um, I can do some evaluations to say you shouldn't drive. Um, any, but any, any of you, me included, um, within the, with the, depart the Department of Motor Vehicles, anybody can go in. Um, if, like, you're a family member concerned, um, you can anonymously report and say, I'm concerned about this person's driving. They will basically suspend their license until they get tested. The other thing I will sometimes do is say, you know, I want you to be evaluated. So occupational therapists will do a drive. There's places to do a driver's evaluation with occupational therapists. That's an unf and the other part I need to say is that unfortunately, it's generally not covered by insurance. It's about 500 bucks. Do you, do you ever request family members to come to the appointments? All the time. <laughs> um, the, and any specific, like if we're having this discussion or, yeah, yeah. Because, um, and usually it's, it's come from the family member. Um, so I'll say, you know, I would like you to come with the, your daughter, your son, your wife. Um, and because it is that goals of care conversation requires kind of everybody in. Question as far as supply and demand, with, with the demographic change in, in the United States, the aging, mm -hmm. getting big, what, are, what is gerontology going to catch up in terms of availability? Do you, do you want do you want the sugar coated answer or the real answer? <laughs> 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 so the question was about you know the, the demographics are shifting, um, you know the population is uh, generally older. Actually, those over the age of eighty five are one of our fastest growing populations. Um, and the question was, when do geriatrics catch up? The, the uh, never. Um, so, as I said, geriatricians are few and far between. Um, so geriatrics is a subspecialty out of family medicine, internal medicine. You have to you go you do a fellowship out of your residency. Um, every year, the match rate for geriatrics fellowships is right around fifty percent. So fifty percent of slots go unfilled. Um, 
as opposed to, say, cardiology, where there are people fighting for spots. <laughs> there's, there's multiple reasons for that. Um, that's part of, like, with the, like, the geriatrics workforce enhancement program. Um, part of the goal of that is to train everybody to uh, be able to provide care for older adults in a more uh, geriatrics type fashion, knowing that we're not going to have all these people be geriatricians. Um, and also because I can't see everybody. <laughs> uh, but those that maybe need a little bit more, then I step in. a good follow from this. <laughs> um, huh? So, um, again, geriatricians are few and far between. Um, outpatient geriatricians are fewer and farther between. <laughs> uh, most geriatricians practice in um, assisted living or long-term care settings um, for good reason. We're needed there. Um, I do, I practice in that setting. I all, because of the nature of my work being educational, I also do outpatient and inpatient. Um, so I'm a geriatrician that does work outpatient. There's like another one, I think. There, there's not very many of us. Um, and you can, so, I mean, you can go to your primary and, um, and you can ask if they would, there's not really a referral because again, there's not that many of us, they can look for me. Um, uh, the other part is that within my clinic, um, I tend to try to have more longer appointments and I kind of push the issue uh, because it's needed. So I can't really force, can't really force anybody into anything. Not me. <laughs> no, 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 I mean really, you can't. Like, um, we can, it, it's kind of the person, I'm gonna die at home, they very well might. Um, so we can strongly recommend that they should be admitted to a, a nursing home. I can even say they don't have capacity to say they can't go to a nursing home, but they still have to get them through the door. And they can, they can walk out. <laughs> um, so you can't really force somebody into it. Um, we can, again, we can strongly recommend it. Um, and it's one of the, it's one of those ones where, let's say, sometimes it has, sometimes the person has to realize it for themselves and sometimes that means returning home and not having a good time. Um, but I've also been very frank with families to say like, this person says they want to die at home and they might, um, and it may not be pretty, but I can't force them to go anywhere. Where on the east side do you practice? Phelan Village Clinic. Oh. Cool, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>